All right, welcome everybody on behalf of the National Career Development Association. Welcome to NCDA's webinar series. We are pleased that you have joined us today. Before we get started, I want to share some technical information for you. During the webinar, your microphone will be muted. We ask that everyone remain focused on the presentation during the webinar, and we will use the chat section, which can be found on the lower section of your screen. It's one that looks like a speech bubble. We'll use that for a Q&A discussion at the end of the webinar. So please, if you can, hold all of your questions and chat discussions until the end. Individuals who have signed up for the webinar can log in to their NCDA account uh, to view their CEU transcripts beginning next week. Groups that are attending will need to return their sign-in sheets to me in order to receive their certificates. This program is appro approved for one contact hour of continuing education. For any questions, you can contact me, Alicia Cheek, at NCDA headquarters. Our presenters today are Dr. Spencer Niles, Dr. Soon Jun Yoon, Dr. Norman Amundsen, and Andrea Fruling. We now present the Threads of Hope Action Theory and Practice. Great. Thanks, Alicia. Um, so welcome. Welcome, everybody. And it's nice to have you all joining us today. Um, I am Andrea Fruling, and we're going to be just talking a little bit about the, the threads of hope. And we, we thought that was a fitting metaphor, just really recognizing that the four of us who are here presenting today each carry different perspectives and different strengths that we have been weaving together and that have contributed to this hope action theory and the work that we're doing with it. And we also want to invite you to bring your own thread of practice in to this space and connect it with ours and, and allow us to strengthen the work that you're doing. And in the work that that you're doing, um, just that we can really, I guess, strengthen each other's work. And so as we begin, I just want to start by acknowledging the land that we do this work from. I am the executive director of the Hope Action Group. And as such, I just want to claim this, this space and acknowledge the space that we our work emanates from. I am coming to you from the west coast of Canada and on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, and more specifically, the Hunkimenum language group. And as I walk the lands that I live on and raise my family on, I'm just very aware of the, the privilege it is to have been able to just connect with the <laughs> land and the spaces around me in the way that I do, um, and also learn from the people that I do and those who have come before us. And part of that is these three brilliant minds that I get to work with. And so we're going to talk through the hope action theory a little bit, um, a little bit about the pinwheel model. And uh, Skip, why don't I pass this to you to get started? Uh, hold on just a second. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see us. What we've done is we're we're we've. Ah uh, uh, yes, there we are. <laughs> there we are. Yes. Well, um, just to say that uh, it's really a privilege for me to be able to work with the group, and uh, and to also provide this experience for for um, for NCDA and for the uh, participants in this webinar. It, it is a model we've been working on for, gosh, over 15 years, and it keeps evolving, keeps developing, and we learn something new, I think, every time. But um, uh, but so I'm I'm privileged to be part of the group. And uh, Andrew, do you want me to get into any of the different parts of the model at this point, or or? Yeah, why don't we just even start by saying like, here, this is the model and I've shared my screen here and um, we're, we're going to be emailing you a copy of this model so you can use it as reference. And so that will, will come, but yeah, Skip, if you wanna just start by kind of giving us a broad picture of the Hope Action model, we can just jump right in. Yeah, sure, great. It's It's really, you know, the way to think about the hope action uh, theory, I think, is really it's a meta theory. 
and <laughs> is connect with and intersect with other more specific theories of career development, but it offers this sort of uh, overarching framework for how people can construct their careers. I hate the word manage their careers. So how they can construct their careers uh, as they move forward and as they engage in their lives each and, and every day. And that's one of the things I love about it. It's so vibrant that way. It acknowledges that the environment constantly has things to, to teach us that we inter we interact with our environment in countless ways each and every day and that part of the process of constructing careers um, mindfully is to to uh, really pay attention to that process that we participate in and those learning experiences that we have and what we can learn uh, by engaging in our worlds, what our world has to teach us, and what that might mean. So it's really a meaning-making process. What that might mean for us as we as we move forward in our careers, our work, and our lives. And obviously, hope is at the center because as we were focused on this initially, we realized that you know there is no theory that really focused on hope whatsoever. And for us, hope is the fuel that drives career development in a constructive direction. Without hope, there's no reason to move forward in any way, it's certainly any way that's constructive. So we wanted to look at, so what can we create that would foster this sense of hopefulness, but not just in a wishful way, not just like, geez, I hope this works out well, but in an action-oriented way. So hope action theory is very much um, theory that emphasizes human agency and it incorporates uh, self-efficacy and motivational uh, thinking relative to how to move forward with um, uh, a variety of, uh, of the components that we're going to talk about. So I don't know, Norm, is there something that you want to? No, I think you, you've really uh, kind of given a nice overview of, of all of this. And of course, we build on theorists as well, build on Snyder's work and Bandura's work and Tim Hall's work. Um, so again, although we come into it with this meta theory, as you called it, uh, you know, it all it all kind of builds from the bottom up. Uh, I think the the key, maybe we should just start looking at the components because that that's really the uh, the key here that tie into hope and uh, i think this idea of threads is really a good one the the image of each of these threads kind of promotes hope so with self-reflection when you and maybe one of the first uh, distinctions we've made which a lot of people don't make is the difference between self-clarity and self-reflection they they often kind of push those two together but uh we felt sort of a need for it and uh i think you're You've done quite a bit of work on the self-reflection dimension, Skip. Do you want to go back to that? Sure. I, yeah, I'd love to. It's it really is. I think you know we each have our I think our favorite parts of this uh, theory, this model, and and this is it this for is me it. because uh, um, it it really is, as Norm said, something that is often overlooked in the process of of. Uh, constructing our careers and given the pace of life, even in a pandemic, maybe especially in a pandemic, given the pace of life, if we don't slow down and engage intentionally in moments of self-reflection, however we might do that, you know, whether it's meditation, uh, listening to music, mindful exercise, yoga, uh, the long list, that uh, they're all relevant and they're all applicable. The question is what applies for you and what's one practice or what are some practices uh, that really is mindfulness that would uh, would allow you to get uh, engage in and that kind of act, that kind of slowing down stepping out of the current the rapid current of everyday life that we we're so focused on human doing to pay attention to a human being how we're evolving and 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 how that Evolution, you know, it's Donald Super said the self concept of all is over time, making choice and adjustment, continuous processes. We're continuously engaged in our own self evolution, but we've got to pay attention. And if you and and if you had to take away self reflection and say, what else would you call it? 
and say, ah, it's simply I'd say, pay attention, pay attention to our experiences and what they have to suggest for us in terms of our ongoing learning that would then lead to self clarity, which, uh, you know, is maybe a time for a career intervention process. And, and traditionally we do various assessments and, and that kind of thing. But um, Norm, uh, you want to pick up on self clarity? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Clarity really is um, something that follows directly from self reflection in many ways, because you do get the meaning and purpose in self reflection. Uh, and in self clarity, there's lots of personal kind of explorations of interests and values, personal style, uh, looking at, um, you know, who you are and how you fit and uh, asking all those kinds of questions, what sort of skills you have. And that's often, I think, probably a traditional kind of view of career guide. I mean, we handle this one or kind of look at self clarity sometimes as that's the key, isn't it? To finding out what you should do with your life. And you can see from this model that it's, it's, it's an important component, but it's only one component, you know, it's just a piece there. Um, but we push it a little bit further. We push it out in terms of visioning, because what we're looking for here is not just a sense of, uh, who you are, but also this image you have it pushing yourself of who are you, where are you going, where are you headed? And um, you can go back to solution focused uh, uh, counseling and look at the um, miracle question or what we're calling uh, vantage points or walking the problem. All of these methods kind of focus on an idea of looking out, imagining where would I, where would I be going? What would it, where would the end of the road be? What am I? And it isn't like that's the end of the road, but that's for that that initial kind of lift or leap forward. What would it look like? And that's where visioning comes into it. Um, I think at this Norm, point, yeah, do you want to? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Can I just interrupt? I'm wondering. Sometimes there's a little bit of confusion that happens around the difference between self reflection and self clarity. Do you want to just speak to that, and then I can share a bit about the work that I've done. Sure. Uh, well, self reflection, self clear. I mean, sometimes we think they're just the same thing, but I think the self reflection is really that, as as Skip said, the the mindfulness stepping back, thinking about the bigger picture. Where am I headed? What am I doing? The idea of meaning in my life. How can I make a contribution? And self clarity is really who I who I am. What what am I coming? What is my particular genius? What am I good at? Uh, you know, what kind of a person am I in terms of uh, my style, my interests, my values, and those two kind of weave together and then push towards visioning. Yeah, may I add something? Um, self clarity, uh, uh, self reflection uh, is more like a process of thinking about yourself, but some people just think endlessly. Self-clarity is an outcome of the self-reflection. So it's, uh, you, you should be able to talk about your strength, or it could be even like roles, but in a tangible way, or you, you, if you could identify what those elements are, then you, you may say that, oh, I reached self-clarity in this uh, aspect. So maybe this is a good point to, I'm going to actually stop sharing my screen. And so you won't see the pinwheel for the rest of our presentation today, but we will be emailing out a copy of it. And we're going to continue just this conversation and working our way around the pinwheel a little bit. Um, but this way you can also see us. There we go. <laughs> Here we are. Um, so I am a, in just, as a response maybe to what we've heard already, some of the work that I do is I am a career coach and I work with clients in this in this world. And so I thought we would just share an example of what we mean um, in a real practical way. And so I had one client that I was working with and this will 
and and she came to me and she was we were about in the middle of this pandemic i mean who knows when the middle is but it was at the end of the summer and uh and and she was burnt out she was a guidance counselor um but she was really burnt out she had taken a leave from work and was just working through what her experience was and knew that there needed there was something else that she needed could see that but wasn't sure how to get there and looking at the hope action theory she was really high really had a clear vision and and knew that there was something else that she needed and could see it and she knew that she needed to do something and change and make the change so she had a lot of she was really high in adapting and envisioning but the actual getting there and the setting the goals and the reflection, being able to understand what it was that was going on, those she was quite low in. And so we we were working together to try, this became quite clear just even in our conversation. And so what <laughs> part of our conversation was, was it centered actually around a metaphor and um, I teach a lot about metaphors and she knew that. So she said, I have a metaphor about this. And she said, I feel, I feel like I'm standing on the edge of a cliff and I'm, I'm ready to just to jump. She said, I'm not in danger. Like I'm safe. There's water below, but I just feel like I'm standing on the edge and, and I just, it, it's terrifying and I've I've left my job, I'm on medical leave and I don't think I can go back, but I don't know what to do. And so we, we talked a bit and we spent a good amount of time just talking that through, talking about her experience and um, partly through our conversation, I said to her, you know, it sounds to me like you, you, t you talk about being ready to jump and, and jumping off this cliff, but I said, what if we think about it as you being ready to soar? And it sounds like you're just getting ready to soar. And she just, everything just sort of shifted for her. And she, she, it was like, she just deflated and she said like, oh yeah, like that's what it is. Like I'm getting ready to soar. And, and as soon as she could imagine where she was heading and, and the just not even where she was heading, but just the different way of thinking about that, everything started to get put into motion. Um, and part of what we talked about, which Norma uh, sort of alluded to as well, is we did talk about, I said, you know, when I was young, I used to go like we would go cliff jumping sometimes and we would have to back up and then we'd have to run forward and kind of we would launch ourselves off of cliffs and and it was fun. <laughs> I said maybe maybe this is uh, maybe this could be fun and maybe this launch could be a fun thing that you could dive into and, and you could get ready to do. And, and it was interesting. She said, oh, yeah, actually. I used to do that too. Interesting. And so she suddenly had this story to connect to and this memory of it being fun that we then could expand and play with. Um, and through that conversation, it, we also started talking about that moving back in order to launch. And, and it became evident that what actually might be the most helpful was a pause to just pause and reflect and care for herself in preparation for that launch. And so, so we, we stayed in touch, but we, we didn't really, we weren't really actively working together for a few months while well, she took that pause to just reflect and, and heal from, from a really hard couple of years. Um, and now she's launched, she is fully launched and it's been such a journey and exciting to see her, her transform that way. But, but you can see how just this, this pinwheel from understanding where she was located and where her strengths were, it really was able to support her in that process of shifting from burnout to launch. Um, June, oh, I, we, we did a little bit of uh, goal setting in that and, and she kind of, as we went, we, she then moved into goal setting. Do you want to talk a bit about the goal setting and planning piece of the pinwheel? Yes, uh, yes. I'm going to share the slides so that the attendees would uh, understand the uh, model and where yes. it is yes. located. So, um, 
those elements like uh, we, we call it hope action competencies um, shouldn't happen sh sh doesn't necessarily to happen in a sequential manner but if you are highly in a career into career planning process uh, step by step then it might uh, make sense to start with self reflection then self clarity then visioning and so on so goal setting come goal setting and planning idea comes uh, assuming that there is a, a vision you would like to reach. So, goal setting planning involves uh, developing strategies to get there uh, to accomplish the um, attractive vision that you have and uh, set goals, maybe um, in, uh, applying smart goal setting principles. Uh, it's, it's not a must, but it's very effective if you apply smart goal setting principles if you uh, if you can help uh, your, your clients out to do so. So, as many people know, uh, SMART um, indicate like SMART specific, measurable, and achievable or attainable. Uh, some people say realistic, but I would say relevant would be a better word because it makes you to align your goals with your important aspects. It could be your vision, or it could be your mission, or interests, values, and so on. And the last one is uh, uh, time bounded or timely. So that's so, how. So you could incorporate a goal setting and planning practice, uh, the smart goal setting principle into goal setting and planning uh, practice. And also, um, yeah, thinking about uh, different steps that you can take for each of the goals. So that's related to uh, goal setting and planning. But we emphasize on the fact that um, the goals and plans need to be aligned with, again, uh, your important priorities. So in our recent book, uh, we have uh, um, kind of a valuable, valuable goals checklist. So, so that uh, after uh, you uh, come up with uh, important goals, it, the checklist allows you to uh, assess to what extent these goals are very uh, highly valuable to you. So uh, those checks and balances in terms of the relevancy uh, can be very important for your goal setting and planning. And once goals and plans are set, then uh, it's time to move on to uh, implementation. Yeah. Skip, would you talk about implementing part? Yeah, you know, I also like what you said about the not necessarily uh, a linear theory that we've developed, and it's also not siloed. I mean, you could be engaged in self-reflection while you uh, while you do any of these other steps, for instance, you know, and same with each of the steps. But, you know, implementation is obviously where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. It's where you take the leap and it's always a leap, isn't it? I mean, you think about anything that you've done, any 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 plan that you've uh, uh, and goals that you've implemented, there's always a leap between what you knew before and what you knew as a result of, of uh, implementing a choice that you've made. And that's the, and that's the gap that exists. And so um, the idea, because in fact, there is that gap, the idea with uh, implementing is that you've got to, um, you've got to uh, consider what you've learned as a result of the action that you've taken. And that really leads us into the process of adapting. And Norm, you want to talk a little bit about adapting? Yeah, I think um, it's interesting with adapting because um, this is really where flexibility comes into it. And I think, you know, we refer to uh, our world today as living in a world of paradox. You know, think of some of the other concepts you're hearing, uh, you know, in the literature, positive uncertainty, planned happenstance, chaos, the S curve. You know, these are things, these are all models that are emerging, the idea of design, you know, we've really moved away from the linear kind of concepts and we are much more into a sense of, you know, take what's happened, uh, sometimes it's not going to work. You got to go to plan B, sometimes to plan C. You, there's always a sense. I really like the concept of positive uncertainty of you got to step into the implementation, step in with hope, step in with conviction, but at the same time, be holding the uncertainty in your hand as well, because it may not work or things may change. I mean, life is so different now than what it was just a few months ago. 
And, uh, you know, we have to sort of hold both of those together and be ready to adapt. And this adaptation can come in many different forms. This is where you, um, you know, when you think of adapting, maybe it's, you know, it goes back to the self-reflection. Uh, maybe you got to step back and pause and say, you know, who am I and what's, what are, where, what do I want to achieve in my life? And some of that, or maybe it's your self clarification. Maybe, you know, I thought I liked math, but I really don't really like it that much now that I'm doing it. Uh, you know, whatever that might be, or th maybe the vision is needs to be corrected or a new goal needs to be put in place, uh, new planning, new action steps. So, um, that pinwheel starts to spin, you know, and when it's spinning, you, you get this move from adaptation to all the other different dimensions. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, that's a good time to talk about the environment and what is it that's spinning this around and uh, what is that wind that's blowing both uh, from us and from, you know, inside and outside. June, do you want to? Yes, um, yeah, as Norm mentioned, uh, we operate uh, in, with uh, interlensing uh, with the environment. So depending on where uh, the wind blows from, the pinwheel uh, turns uh, in different ways. So depending on whether it, blow, whether it blows from front or back, it turns uh, different ways. So uh, our, th therefore, uh, as a result of that, uh, our actions uh, change. So that's uh, adapting. So um, uh, Skip mentioned that uh, we've incorporated uh, Albert Bandura's uh, human agency theory uh, among other theories. Um, and uh, in his uh, social cognitive theory, uh, there is a, a, a triadic uh, in, interrelationships between uh, or among environment and uh, cogn cognition and behavior. And so, in in in, um, in short, uh, it's a interaction between environment and self. So we wanted to detect uh, the bidirectional uh, inter uh, interactions between self. So those uh, seven competencies are what individuals will practice. And we uh, practice those uh, competencies in relationship to the environment. So considering environment is very important, so why it is important is that uh, we did a study about 10 years ago already um, with uh, about 1,600 uh, US and Canadian college students. And among them, uh, we identified people who had uh, high perceived uh, level of barriers for their education. So they had all kinds of barriers. Um, like uh, we, 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 select, we selected about 20 of them and we ended up interviewing uh, 16. Uh, among those ones uh, who have high, almost, almost highest uh, perceived level of barriers, but at the same time, high level of hope, almost perfect level of hope. So those two do not go very well together. So we were curious, but those ones who had barriers had like uh, physical uh, issues, uh, financial issues, relationship, and so on. So um, we interviewed them and find, found out that the number one factor uh, which everyone which, yeah. had uh, that made them to be hopeful was support. It can be support from significant, significant other support from their school or even a pet, right? Mm -hmm. So support uh, within your environment is critical uh, for you to be hopeful. And uh, the attendees here, uh, you could be the support for your client or your, your students and even your uh, family members uh, in order uh, to make them uh, hopeful. And so in, in doing so, uh, it is critical for you to create or find environment, uh, a supportive environment for you. So I really encourage, or I hope Action Theory encourages you to create a support system for you. So it, it could be finding out um, like uh, like-minded people. It could be to find a mentor. We can be multiple mentors, or it could be uh, part of um, a professional organization like NCDA that can support um, where you can find people who can support you 
or organization uh, that can support you, uh, things like that. So it is critical for you to um, help clients uh, to think about the environment, how to maximize the utilization of environment. And when you go through all these steps or those elements in hope action theory, uh, it is important for you to consider all those aspects uh, in relation to environment. All right, so. June, I wonder if it would be just interesting for people watching this. Um, I know I think you're going to talk about the assessment in just a moment, but even just to pause and for yourself think, whereabouts maybe are you most comfortable on this pinwheel? If you work with clients, maybe there's one area that, that you lean towards or that you're most interested in. Um, and And even just for yourself right now we're right now it is it's march and we're at the, um almost one full year of, of lockdown and challenges with this pandemic and whereabouts are you maybe the strongest on this pinwheel and whereabouts are those places that maybe are being impacted by the environment um and and maybe both ways maybe you're being impacted by by the pandemic, but also how are you impacting the people around you? And maybe there's something that you can do or just recognize as you hear us talk through this whole pinwheel. And if you're not sure, maybe this is a good point to just, um, June, if you want to talk a little bit about the Hope Action Inventory and the role that can play in working with clients. Yeah. 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 After we developed uh, the theory, uh, we turned uh, the components into uh, an assessment tool so that we can scientifically uh, measure those uh, components. So we've been using Hope Action Inventory and other practitioners and researchers have been using Hope Action Inventory for two purposes. One was to uh, develop intervention ideas because once you once uh, clients take Hope Action Inventory, they will be able to know uh, their strengths and challenges. Because uh, you will get a spider web type uh, diagram as a result of taking a hope action uh, inventory. So, so you could highlight strength uh, uh, with your, to your uh, clients, but at the same time, you could identify uh, where you could work on or your clients uh, could work on. Um, so let's say um, Andrea mentioned that that the the client. Uh, was strong, uh, strong in envisioning and adapting. But what about hope and self-reflection and so on? So uh, it gives you a sense regarding the direction of your innovation that you could provide. So that's, uh, I hope action inventory can be used for that purpose. And another purpose is to uh, measure the effectiveness of intervention. So hope action theory is designed to be evidence-based. And we've accumulated uh, lots of evidence that uh, uh, this uh, theory and practice uh, works. And we've worked <coughs> with um, uh, unemployed population and um, refugees, North Korean defectors, and uh, in, uh, immigrants, uh, and so on. So, so, and we've captured data uh, using uh, Hope Action Inventory. So you could do the same thing if you are planning to offer a series of innovations for a group of people, let's say, then you can let uh, the participants to take uh, hope action inventory. You could add other other measures as well, and you can allow them to take um, uh, the hope action inventory uh, after delivering uh, the intervention. Then you will you can you will be able to see the difference. And if uh, you've offered it uh, effectively following addressing those hope action theory elements, then it is likely that you will see a significant statistical difference between pre-test and post-test. Uh, we've been accumulating those uh, evidence and uh, if you do it right, it works. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks, June. I wonder just before we move on here, Norm or Skip, do either of you want to connect this back to hope or is there anything else that we can we need to tie together here before we continue well i think i just 
think that uh, really to pay attention here to the fact that hope is in the center, you know, that it is everything attaches to hope. Uh, it's interesting. We, we kind of playfully built these little pinwheels for ourselves as we were uh, preparing for this presentation and others. But one of the things that you had to do was, you know, it just came in a flat box, but you had to attach each one of these to the center and you realize how important the hope is. And you also realize they kind of overlap with each other as well. And I think that's another part is the, the overlapping, you know, that it isn't just a, uh, okay, here's now we got this one component. Now we got the other component things we're really trying to get. We really want to have, a an integrated model, a model that's flexible, that uh, moves around a little bit, and you can't get everything with every uh, model that you create, but we're very pleased with the what we've created, and I think it's done very intentionally. Skip, you got anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, just to say briefly that if you go, if you go back to Snyder's uh, 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 hope theory and 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 break that down and and apply it then to each of these different components of hope action theory. You know, it really starts with this notion of each and every instance having a having a goal to focus on, whether it's on reflection or self clarity all the way through, having some sense of where you and the client is headed, what you're focused on. You know, if you think about hope as this process of holding the creative tension between what has been and what could be in a person's life and then taking action each and every day to close the gap between those two what is and what could be that's where that's where hope emerges and it has to have a goal to focus on and it has to have uh steps to take pathways steps to take to achieve the goal to move towards that end point that you're imagining now i also think that goals are made to be revised and as you get more and more information, it's kind of a positive uncertainty norm, but more and more information, you have to say, okay, what does this mean in, tor in terms of where I may be headed and what I aspire to and what pathways then or what steps are relevant for the new and emerging goal? And in each and every case, and the thing I really like about the work that uh, Snyder left to us, and that is the notion that as you identify those steps, the, there are two critical questions. Are you confident that you can complete those uh, steps successfully? If yes, fine. If no, okay, let's back, let's back up and break them down into steps that are more manageable for the client or student that you're working with. And then finally, what's your motivation? Are you going to are you going to actually take those steps? If you honestly consider the steps you've identified for the goal that you've clarified, will you, will you do the action? Will you take the, the action? To move towards that goal, so and with and you can apply that to each and every one, uh, each and every part of hope action theory. Yeah, great. Um, maybe this is a good time. If anybody has questions that you're wondering about, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the training that we have that we're doing. But if you have questions, feel free to put them in. The Q and A, the chat. I'm not sure, Alicia. Feel free to correct me if you're here. Um, <laughs> but uh, put them in, and we'll track them, and we'll come back and answer some of your questions about any anything here. Um, so I'll share my screen again. And what we've done is, in recognizing just the power that this work has, we we just we want to share it, and we want to we we felt like oh we just need to share this in a way that is, uh, a, just supporting people to be able to really activate that pinwheel and and this theory and and how help them see it come to life in your own practice whatever that might look like and so we have a certification that we are going to be delivering it's coming up in april and it runs it's a five-week certification and in it we've really developed a bit of an interesting structure where you have it's a blended learning program there are live weekly sessions with the four of us or some variation of the four of us 
Um, you are supported and interacting with us throughout the course. You have access to pre recorded webinars that you can watch that are more sort of bite sized lectures. And so we can be more interactive in those live sessions. You also become part of a learning triad, so a group of three that you you travel through the course with and meet with weekly and practice what you're learning and we come and visit you in those sessions. Um, and we really are hoping with this certification to have a really a small cohort so that we can be very hands on and really connect and get to know and build a community with you as we go. What you can expect, so the dates are April 24th to June 13th. Um, we cover the Hope Action Theory. We talk about the Hope Action Inventory and you practice using that as well. We also just talk about like essential skills you need to have good career conversations. We will talk through working with metaphors and different kinds of ways of engaging with clients that really help activate the different parts of the wheel. And then we also bring in the an organizational perspective. So thinking a little bit more broadly about that environment and the systems approach and how you can really look at what you're doing from a bigger picture and start activating the pinwheel in your practice. Um, so if you do, if you are interested or would like to learn more, we would love to talk to you. You can go to double knot dot works slash hope and there's a recording there that I talk you through all the different pieces and parts of all the information about it. You can find out more there. Um, you can also schedule a call if you just have questions and you want to know more. And <laughs> though, we would just love to hear from you. We would love to we love hearing about how you see this being used, how you've taken even what you've heard today and are applying it. Um, and so feel free to connect with us. Um, the Hope Action Group is on LinkedIn and you also can just send us an email and we'd love to hear from you. Um, Alicia, are there any questions that are coming in at all? No, there have not been any yet. We do have about 15 minutes left. If anybody has any questions, you can start typing those in the chat section now. Yeah, so 15, the final 15 minutes are devoted for questions and answers for the entire content, the uh, whole passion theory and practice. So if you have any questions, uh, really please uh, feel free to share. While we're waiting for that, I, I could just say another thing about the research that we've been doing, because I think that, and, and June, you kind of alluded to, the, you know, the work that has been done with students and immigrants and refugees and unemployed clients working uh, not only with face to face methods, but also online methods and online kind of comparing <laughs> that and our most current the current study that we're working on right now is working with uh, people who are dealing with addictions and uh, coming through that and what they realize is that one of the components they, they think there's uh, speculating here that uh, hope is probably a center point for um, for being able to really get yourself turned around and integrated back into society and so that's kind of what we're doing now but we're we've really been excited about the fact that with all these different groups everybody um, you know good things have been happening and so the possibilities uh, you know for you in your situation and uh, we love talking to people, uh, working with different kinds of clientele, and maybe uh, there's a way that some of this work can uh, fit with what you're doing as well, you know. I'm just going to share my screen here with the um, information about contacting us. So if you are interested, feel free to, yeah, reach out. We do have one question from Karen Parker. She says the pinwheel graph has hope in the middle and arrows indicating actions tied to hope. Would that be applied to each step or just a general injection? Can you read that again, Alicia? I, I, your audio was a little. Yeah, I'm actually going to post it here for everyone. It says the pinwheel graph has hope in the middle 
an arrow <laughs> indicating actions tied to hope. Would that be applied to each step or just a general injection? Okay, I will go back to the hope model so we can look at it. Um, there it is. Um, I think that maybe the, that question is connecting is connected to the environment arrows that you're seeing. Um, June, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, so yeah, the, act, the arrows, bi-directional arrows are meant to be the relationship between you as an individual and the environment. Right, so um, yeah, that, that, that's that. And what, what, what's, uh, what's the other one uh, Middle in the case? Yeah, hope would, uh, let's see, actions. Yeah, yeah. so the here, um, the kind of hypothesis uh, that we have is um, that every, anything that we do, like if you increase self-reflection, if you're engaged in self-reflection, then uh, hope uh, will go up a bit because you will find something about you that makes you hopeful. Right? And if you uh, reach a certain level of clarity, let's say, oh, you developed a mission statement that crystallized uh, you today, then your level of hope may go up. Likewise, if you develop uh, a um, desired future images, it could be through, let's say, vision board exercise, then your hope uh, may go up. So it can it can be also like the, those arrows. Although the arrow arrows meant uh, the interactions between individual and environment or agent and environment, there is also bi-directional arrow between uh, or arrows between hope and uh, hope action competencies uh, surrounding competencies. Because uh, let's suppose that you have very high level hope, it is likely that you will act on something. It, it can help you to engage in visioning activities, or if you, it, it can help you to implement something, if you're hopeful. Um, to help you to understand it further, let's suppose that you are in despair, you are highly, highly frustrated uh, by something, then you wouldn't want to make a, any step forward. Right? So that's uh, the effect of having hope. So that uh, the effect would be, uh, or the relationships, uh, or effect would be bi-directional. It, you know, it's interesting. I think we're learning more and more about these relationships with each research study that goes on. And I just actually on uh, on, on Tuesday uh, participated in a dissertation defense where the student did a very uh, sophisticated random, randomized control trial study in which she looked at the relationship between mindfulness, self-reflection, uh, hope, and resilience and found that those who are practicing mindfulness, in this case was something called, uh, it's a meditation called centering prayer, that folks that did that on a regular basis, twice a day, over a four week period, uh, increased in hope and also increased in their resilience, their, their capacity to respond to stressful events in their lives. So I think, yeah, the relationships here are kind of uh, intermingled with each other and, we're learning more and more as we look at each of these components and how they are supportive of each other in many ways. It's interesting when you, you think about hope. I mean, I always like putting it down to a real practical little exercise. Like, uh, you know, if, you, if you're not feeling hopeful, if you're feeling in despair, one of the things that happens is your head often drops and you look downward, you know, that, that despairing look. Is like this. Hopeful looks are where your your head is high and you're looking out. And just think how that how that shift in body position, where you, you know, the despair is kind of looking forward, and you get this. I can't do anything, or just very small steps. And when you are hopeful, yeah, you know, the chin goes up. You, your vision increases. Your breadth of vision increases as well as distance, and uh, and you and you look at lots of uh, additional possibilities. Um, it's something I think that we experience every day. There's another question here, and I don't know um, who wants to answer it, but wondering about the structure of the Hope Action Inventory and measuring the impact of the environment on each competency. 
Yeah, I think I, I can answer it. Um, the current version of Hope Action Inventory uh, only measures uh, those seven uh, competencies, including hope, without uh, environment. So that's a great question, and that's something that we need to consider uh, for the next version of uh, Hope Action Inventory. And so, maybe we could add, oh, sorry, Jun. Yeah. I was gonna say maybe we could add that this is where we are recognizing the where the certification even comes in, really recognizing the skill required in acknowledging some of these pieces like understanding how the environment is impacting the pinwheel and how these pieces rather than learning one one thing that fits for each um, or one step that fits for each section of this pinwheel it's really understanding how it all works together and how the understanding of the environment on all of the different components is is really so important um, there's a question about the level of mental health needed for the this theory to be useful um, and how it would work with someone dealing with symptoms of mild depression mm -hmm. in addition to the need to make career decisions. I, and I, maybe, oh, yeah. sorry, I could just point you back even to that, that story that I shared about the client that I was working with. Um, that would be just maybe help in that understanding, but Norm, go ahead. How would you? Well, I mean, I think that, that the, uh, Sometimes the activities we do deal with that depression. I, we were, uh, Andrea and I were actually just working with a group earlier this week, a group of young people. Um, and, you know, we did sort of a storytelling exercise, kind of uh, self clarity, helping them just, you know, discern some of the strengths they have and, ha and have the group supporting them. And the sense of hopefulness just kind of went up quite a bit. So, you know, you could just sense, see it in the group. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, you also, I think, in your case study there, Andrea, that, that was probably a, a factor as well, right? Yeah. We also have data from different research studies and some really populations that are going through some tough transitions, as Norm mentioned, Syrian refugees, the uh, uh, immigrants to can healthcare workers or recent immigrants yep. uh, to Canada. And in that in particular, you can see uh, through interviews that were done with that particular population, as well as quantitative data that were collected, that the shift from the, the beginning of being introduced to hope action theory, uh, a good way to describe it is folks were depressed or experiencing depression because think about it, the things that they had been trained for in another country, their training wasn't recognized in their current country. And they felt a bit hopeless about that. Hopelessness is a version of depression. And so, um, through exposure to the hope um, action theory and each of the components within the theory, and then post test uh, and end of uh, exposure interviews, uh, the difference was, I think, significant and remarkable. And that's been a consistent finding across all these uh, tough uh, populations. And I say tough because they're in challenging situations. And that's really what the theory was developed for. You know, we're really focused on those folks that struggle to have a sense of hope in their lives, often through no fault of their own. And they might not have the contextual affordances that others, other more privileged folks tend to have. And so how can we, how can we influence those people uh, to to create a sense of hope and then sustain it. And it seems like with the research that we've done, gosh, I don't know the total number of story uh, studies now, it's probably close to double digits. Uh, that's been a consistent finding all the way through. The interesting too about the research is that some of the research studies, like that one you're referring to, Skip, uh, the one with uh, the immigrants, it wasn't just, it, you know, sometimes you say, oh, yeah, well, they got a higher score and something and, you know, the, our w willingness to trust something like that is one thing, but actually to watch how they changed, how the motivation went up, how they moved from people that were feeling hopeless that they could not get accredited. That was the big problem. Yes. They could not right. get accredited. 
they they came you know to the country feeling like great this great opportunity then they tried that accreditation process and it just became so difficult that they said what's the use of quit and uh, by the end they were getting themselves uh accredited and uh you know carrying on and and a lot most of them are all now working in uh you know very successful kind of uh, occupations we we actually uh you know in that kind of research uh we we want a sort of a little award for that for the uh innovation um uh, in in that field so yeah I'm just noticing there's three minutes left here um, and just wanting to wrap up. So if you have a question, get it in quick. Um, but in the meantime, I wonder, I, I, we didn't plan this, but um, Skip, you, you talk a lot about self-reflection and, and this moment that we have here together maybe would be good to leave on a note of self-reflection. Um, do you have a, maybe a poem or something? that we could close on. Sure, I, 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 I think if, if we consider the work that we're doing, all of us, all of us on this webinar, uh, I think this poem applies. And that is uh, that, that the brief poem that uh, is one of my favorite parts of one of David White's poems, which is that I look at everything growing so wild and faithfully beneath the sky. And I wonder why it is that we, you and me, uh, we are the one terrible part of creation privileged to refuse our flowering. We have the option of not acknowledging, of not embracing our own uniqueness, our own gifts, and many people don't. And so I think a huge component of our work is to help people embrace who they are, embrace their own uniqueness, empower them, in that process. And to me, more than anything else, good career intervention is about just that. Great. Thank you. And thank you, all of you. Um, we've I've been hearing from some people and yeah, we look forward to connecting with you and hearing more about any other questions you have and what else we can do to support you as you explore hope. Alicia, I'll hand it back to you. Great. Thank you, and thank you again to our presenters today. Um, everybody, just a reminder, I will be sending out a follow-up email um, beginning of next week. It will have the recording link to this webinar, as well as information about how to um, get your CE transcript for this event. So thank you all for joining us today, and thank you to our presenters. I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thanks, Alicia. Thanks, Alicia. <laughs>